Okay, welcome, welcome to the second uh, session. Um, I don't think I need to, pre um, to present the presenters um, and the discussant were, were known. I don't think neither that I have to repeat the rules, though no, I think they must have been said um, so as to share the, the one hour we have and include a discussion. But I was asked to repeat that um, you should always speak into the speakers because there may be a YouTube film movie made out of this uh, conference and therefore apparently people don't, don't remember this detail. Okay, then let's start, Arvind. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, this is work I, I've been doing with Adam Guran and Tim McQuaid. Tim is my um, colleague at Stanford. And as the title suggests, it's about mortgage design. So uh, before I go into the details of the, mo of the model, I just wanted to maybe spend one slide just motivating why I think this is an important topic. Um, so I think we all probably understand, you know, certainly from the recent crisis, if not from past crisis, that high levels of debt are a significant source of, uh, of an amplifier during financial downturns. And uh, when we think debt, we have, again, from the recent experience, it's debt both in the banking sector as well as the household sector. Um, I have made a slide here where, I, where I'm drawing the contrast between how policy has thought about banks and households when it comes to debt. So if you just think about the macro prudential tools that we have to deal with high levels of debt in banks versus households, there's actually quite a big contrast. So take banks. Um, you know, banks get in trouble with high levels of debt. Ex post, there's a collection of tools to deal with that. So central banks can provide liquidity against high levels of debt. Uh, governments have certainly in, in recent years recapitalized banks, so there's ways to deal with debt directly through government intervention ex post. And then one of the things uh, that we have seen uh, post-crisis in terms of an ex-ante, you know, pre-crisis, is higher capital requirements, so reducing debt levels in the banking system, uh, as well as uh, innovations in contract design. And what do I mean by contract design here? I mean things like uh, securities that convert into equity during uh, bad times. All of this kind of uh, incre increases the resilience of the banking sector's high levels of debt uh, uh, during downturns. Now, if you look at the household side, on the other hand, my, my sense, and this is what I'm going to tell you, is that far less uh, is done and is, is, uh, has been done and is capable of being done. So first of all, if I, if I think about the US experience ex post with high levels of household debt, my read on the studies of mortgage modifications in the crisis is that they were largely unsuccessful. Um, institutional rigidities in the way in which modifications were pushed through meant that what happened uh, was much, much, much less in terms of uh, debt relief than was equivalently available, say, to banks. So there's, there's little exposed uh, ways of dealing with household debt. So think about ex ante. Well, one of the things that has happened since crisis is, say, increased uh, LTV ratios, reducing debt levels going into crisis. And that is a, uh, a way of dealing with debt. But it's different when you think about households than when you think about banks, because, of course, households don't raise equity. So you can't just impose a high LTV constraint in a household and say that the household would raise equity the way you would with a bank. The household has to finance it internally, and that immediately means that housing demand will, will be affected. So that means to me that, the, that the, the lowest hanging fruit here that hasn't really been studied is contract design on the household side. Um, and so that's just a pitch for why I think this is an interesting and important issue, and that's what I'm going to take you through. Okay, so uh, with that, the, this, uh, this paper is about uh, mortgage design. Uh, and so it's about contract design. And the, the question for the paper is, how does uh, different forms of indexation uh, translate into um, household behavior, uh, consumption behavior, uh, default behavior, as well as home price behavior? So that's the, the question for this paper. Now, at a, kind of just at a, a basic theoretical level, I'm, it's fairly obvious, I suspect, to everyone in this room that adding state contingencies to mortgages must enhance welfare. Um, the, uh, you know, we, if we think about the, uh, in the US we have the, the standard mortgage is this 30 year long term fixed rate mortgage. So it just seems obvious that putting some state contingency there has to, has to benefit things. And many people have proposed different forms of state contingencies, um, you know, equity indexation to uh, home price indices. 
uh, and other forms of indexation. So it's, it sort of seems obvious that that, sh that should be beneficial. Uh, there's some questions about why that hasn't been done, and those would be theoretical questions. I'm not going to approach that. So the question for this paper is going to be, uh, indexation is clearly should be beneficial. So how much, how beneficial might different forms of indexation be? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show take a take a model that is a reasonable representation of households, of the housing market, and I'm going to just throw in different mortgage contract designs, and I'm going to compute for you. Uh, welfare benefits of different contract designs, uh, and I'll try to rank them. That's, that's the exercise in this paper. The contract designs I'm going to look at are all contract designs where indexation is off of interest rates. Right? So monetary policy varies with the state. Uh, so a natural way of thinking about indexation might be to index off of monetary policy. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to study contract designs where the state contingency is all coming through indexing mortgage payments in different ways to interest rates, and I'll, I'll, I'll rank them, as I said. I'm not going to go out and do things like principal indexation, say, linked to home prices. We have looked at that, but I'm not going to show you those results uh, in what I have today. Okay, so uh, the exercise of this paper is I'm going to uh, build a, a model. It's a heterogeneous agent macro model. Um, I'll take you through it. It's kind of what you'd expect. It's a, there's a, it's a life cycle model of uh, people uh, buying homes, earning income, et cetera. Um, we sort of build it in a way that we think we can reasonably, realistically represent household behavior. Um, the model is mostly in partial equilibrium. There's one uh, equilibrium, one market which we'll close in general equilibrium, and that is the housing market. And that the, the reason we're going to close that market is because we'd like to allow the model to speak about home price spillovers. So when people foreclose or default, that affects home prices, which then affects consumption, default, et cetera. So that's the only equilibrium object that we're going to have in there. Uh, as I said, we'll calibrate this in a way that we think is uh, reasonable. I'll talk about it as I go through. And then what I'm going to show you is, a, uh, is as I said, a, a collection of quantitative simulations. And the simulations are going to be as, as following. I'm going to take the US downturn, 2007, 2009. I'm going to assume that what happened in 2007, 2009 was coming from a world where everybody had long-term fixed rate mortgages. And then I'm gonna rerun that where I throw in a different mortgage design, right? Uh, so I'll just throw in a collection of different mortgage designs and I'll compute out how much better households would be under different mortgage designs. And I'll give you some numbers and we'll learn something about uh, how mortgage designs uh, can affect welfare. Okay, so there's really two main results that I'm gonna try to show you today. Uh, the first one, and these are all really quantitative statements. Uh, the first one is that if you kind of sort among different types of mortgage design, the best forms of indexation have this feature that they reduce, they relax budget constraints for particularly for young uh, homeowners, so people who bought homes recently who are relatively constrained, so their, their savings is low, they're, they've bought a home and they're kind of uh, up against uh, uh, payment constraints, an indexation, a form of indexation that relaxes those payment constraints can deliver big welfare benefits. So it's going to be, you know, there are different forms of indexation. Almost all forms of state contingent indexation will deliver welfare benefits. But if you sort among different forms of indexation, this one seems to do a particularly good job. And I'll give you some intuition for why that's working, and I'll show you some numbers about that. Okay, so that's one result that I'll try to stress in this presentation. And then another thing that I'm going to try to stress is as I said, the state contingency in the set of mortgages that I'm going to consider here are all through uh, monetary policy. So monetary policy, state contingency, so we'll piggyback off of that in thinking about indexation. And I'll show you how different forms, uh, how, how monetary policy in, uh, interacts with the benefits of indexation. So for example, QE policies um, can, will affect how uh, you think about different mortgage contracts because they'll affect the long end of the yield curve. And so mortgage, mortgage contracts that are more pinned to the long end of the yield curve will have benefits tied to QE policy. So there's an interaction with monetary policy that I'll also try to explain. Okay. Um, let me just go straight to the model. Um, so here's the model. There's actually, I'm not going to show you any equations. Um, so Monica showed you a few equations. Pierre showed you more equations. I will show you zero equations. Uh, but I think you can actually all sort of fill in the pieces in your head as I talk this through. Okay, so what is the model? It's, as I said, we're trying to build a model that is a realistic representation of a household that is going through their life cycle, making decisions about uh, when to take on a mortgage, when to buy a house, when to pay down a mortgage, Those, the set of collection of questions that you would think of as being relevant for uh, mortgages. So the, the, the model is an OLG model. 
um, uh, agents in this world are going to live for 45 periods. They're going to earn income for 36 periods. As they go through their 36 periods of earning income, they're, ha they're going to have a life cycle income profile that we're going to match in a way that is uh, to kind of the best of what we know about life cycle income. Uh, then they're going to hit a retirement period. So as they go through this, they're going to, uh, uh, they're, they're going to also uh, accumulate housing. So as, at some point in their life, they'll choose to want to buy a house. They'll get some benefits from housing uh, consumption. They could also choose to rent, but they'd get lower benefits from renting a house. So at some point, they'll want to buy a house. When they buy a house, they'll want to take a mortgage. The mortgages that I'm going to consider are, are these mortgage designs. So just to explain this, let me talk about a long-term fixed rate mortgage. At some point, they'll want to buy a house. Uh, they'll tie in, they'll lock in a long-term fixed rate mortgage when they buy the house. That purchases purchase of the house and the, and the, and the taking of this long-term fixed rate mortgage will be subject to a collateral constraint. So there's an LTV constraint that a bank is going to impose on the household when they're making this loan. Um, if, uh, if with the long-term fixed rate mortgage, there'll be chances for the household, for example, to move, to prepay their mortgage, to refinance. So all of the sort of stuff that we think of in the world will be available to our household in this world. Okay. Um, there's uncertainty in the world. The uncertainty uh, affects a couple different things. The first thing I'm going to talk about is just income. So as I said, households are going through their lives earning a life cycle income profile. Uh, income is stochastic, though. And it's stochastic in a couple different dimensions. First of all, there's three aggregate states, a expansion, a recession, or a crisis. And so those states will, will also index income. So there's high income, low income, uh, very low income. Uh, there's also an idiosyncratic income shock. Uh, in which, particularly in the crisis state, income is going to be more left skewed. Right? So you could get a, a given individual could get a, get a very bad income shock, basically gets unemployed, in which case income falls a lot. And that will also vary according to this aggregate state. So there's an aggregate level effect on income, and there's an idiosyncratic component to income that's going to move across states. All of this is in keeping with what I understand about the income processes for households. And as I said, we, we're going to calibrate this in a way that matches uh, the world fairly well. Okay, so that's the household income profile. Um, there's also two other aggregate shocks. Uh, the other aggregate shock is, is a credit supply shock. So banks are going to supply credit in this market, these mortgages that households are going to take, and the credit is going to be supplied subject to an LTV constraint. Okay, and I'm going to allow the LTV constraint to be either high or low. So in the model, in the calibration, it's going to be either 95% or 80%, and that will that'll move around stochastically. Okay, so the aggregate states are expansion, recession, crisis, as well as this credit supply, either high or credit supply low. All right, so with that, that kind of describes the aggregate states. Monetary policy is just a set of numbers. For each of these states, I can, I can say an interest rate. So in the expansion state, there's an interest rate. In, the, in each of these states, there's an interest rate. That sets the short rate. That, the, that short rate then feeds in directly into mortgage rates. How does it feed in directly into mortgage rates? It's basically off of a bank present value condition. A bank is making a loan in the mortgage market. They can fund it uh, using the present value of interest payments, and they're just going to take a PV operator on their mortgage loans. Uh, and so that will set the mortgage rate uh, at subject to the bank making a minimum, um, uh, minimum profit condition. Okay? And as we change mortgage designs, we're just going to do this present value operator for different payment streams. Uh, and get the same present value profit for the bank. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, the banking side. Um, as I said, so agents go through their life, they, they take mortgages, they make payments, they mortgages amortize over their life, they refinance, they might move. So in, the, in, this, in this model, there, people are going to get moving shocks. So they're going to get taste shocks that make them sort of separate from their current home and move into a new home. And so there's going to be some churn in the housing market. All of this is kind of what you'd hope to put into a a model, so it'll all be in there, um, and so that's the that's the mortgage side. And as I and as I said, the there's uh, uh, two constraints here. So there's an LTV constraint when when you buy a home that the bank is going to impose on you. And then the last thing I should emphasize is that the only thing that you can borrow against is your home. So uh, households here are going to be liquidity constraints. They aren't going to be able to borrow against future income. They will be able to borrow against home. So home has this collateral value. Um, all right, so that is the model. I'm not going to show you any equations. Hopefully, I've given you enough of a sense as to what is in the model that most of you can kind of fill in the details. Um, the, uh, 
there's uh, two equilibrium objects in this model. So as I said, the model is mostly partial equilibrium in the sense income processes, I'm just gonna throw in exogenously, They're, we're just choosing them to match life cycle income profiles. There's only two equilibrium objects. The first one is home prices. Um, so in the model, there's going to be a housing market clearing condition every period. There's gonna be a bunch of guys who are going to be buying houses. Who are they? They're mostly young guys in this model. Uh, young guys who are transiting from renting to home ownership uh, or they might be some, there's going to be a small group of buyers who are going to be buyers who were foreclosed on previously or who were defaulted previously who will have their defaults cure over some time and then they'll come back and they'll buy some houses. So that's the housing purchase side of the market. And then the housing supply side, who sells houses here? Well, it's a combination of, of things. It's old people who are getting out of housing. And then it's uh, some financially distressed sellers. So households are defaulting and banks are foreclosing on homes. Uh, there's, there's going to be some of that, and there's going to be some movers who are churning the housing market as well. So that's the housing market equilibrium. Um, as, as I've described this model, you can kind of see that at every point in time, there are 45 cohorts of households. So this is, the, you know, the state space here is very large, so we had this usual very large state variable problem. Uh, and how are we going to solve it? We're going to solve it, and I guess what is now the standard way in the literature, we're going to follow this Crusell smith approach of sort of uh, specifying a low-dimensional function for how prices are gonna move over time, uh, just as a function of a few state variables. And we will iterate the model and converge on what that price function that best represents the, uh, the, the evolution of prices is. And then you can do a bunch of checks. For example, a standard check that you want to do is, we're gonna be, we're gonna be uh, uh, guessing a low dimensional forecast rule that's one period ahead. And one check you can do with whether that's a good representation of the forecast rule is, see whether your forecast rule works 10 periods ahead. So forecast 10 years out with that one period forecast rule, does it actually match the simulation? And so we're, we're, we checked all of those things and the forecast rule generally works well. You can look at the paper for how well this does. Okay, so that's the housing market. And I mentioned this already, the other equilibrium object I should have, I should have mentioned is the mortgage spread. So you know how banks are breaking even on giving mortgage contracts. And so they set, a, they set an interest rate on their mortgage contract based upon this break even condition. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll, we will, as we change mortgage designs, we'll just ensure that banks make the same profit. Okay, so that keeps all the mortgage designs on sort of the same footing. Okay, so calibration. Um, we, we try really hard to do a good job in the calibration. And there's, there's really two conceptual parts of this calibration. One part of it is just representing household behavior in terms of levels well. So match income profiles well. Match distributions of things like LTVs, of wealth, match those well in the data. Okay, so that's, that's about just matching the levels. That's important because, for example, one of the, the, the main simulation I'm gonna show you today is I'm going, to, I'm going to rerun the 2007, 2009 crisis with different mortgage designs, and it's important to match the LTV distribution of the world uh, in that, in that ex exercise because depending upon the LTV distribution, a given set of shocks will have bigger or smaller effects. So we want to match that level uh, fairly well, and we do. The other thing that we're going to match is we're going to match what I'm going to call a slope. So as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned to you, the, the, other, the, the equilibrium aspect of this model is there's going to be a feedback between home prices, consumption, and default. So there's an equilibrium home price feedback mechanism, and we're going to try to match that based upon fairly nice uh, quasi-experimental evidence. So there are these nice papers by Fuster and Woolen who are able to isolate what the impact on different households who have different levels of, uh, say, temporarily low income or temporarily tight budgets and how that impacts their default behavior. So that is, a, that is about how, if I was to reduce someone's income, how they would change their default behavior. So we have nice experimental evidence from that. We can replicate that within our model. That is, we can sort of simulate their experiments in our model and we'll replicate that. So what, what does that mean? We've replicated now sort of a, a level of how households behave as well as how they're behaving with regards to temporary declines in their income or with increases in their uh, payments, okay? Um, so with that, that's the calibration. The rest of it is fairly standard. As I said, there are these aggregate states, expansions, recessions, crises. There's interest rates I'm gonna specify through that and so we can just simulate this model out as we go forward, okay? All right, so I'm gonna show you um, mainly kind of one set of counterfactuals. So what I'm gonna take you through is, as I said, I'm gonna rerun the 2007-2009 crisis. This means 
I'm going to feed in income shocks that look like income shocks in the world. I'm going to tighten the LTV constraint from 95% to 80%. So I'm going to tighten the LTV constraint. That's going to decrease housing demand and push down home prices. Okay? And I'll show you a slide in the next picture. Just doing those two things kind of reasonably represents what happened to the US 2007 to 2009. All right. That simulation that I'm going to show you is under the assumption that everybody in the world has a fixed rate mortgage, a long-term fixed rate mortgage. Then I'm going to do a collection of exercises. So the first exercise I'm going to do is I'm going to take everyone in the world, I'm going to swap out their long-term fixed rate mortgage, and I'm going to imagine that at the beginning of the crisis, someone could sort of wave a magic wand and put everybody into an adjustable rate mortgage. Why adjustable rate mortgage? Because interest rates fall a lot as we go into the recession. Right? And so there'll be some reduction in payments off of that. And I'll show you how much that benefits households. Right? So I'll show you that. And then I'll do other exercises where I allow people to choose adjustable rate mortgages ex ante before a crisis, and I'll show you how that impacts welfare. Okay? And then I'll show you other mortgage designs. And there's more mortgage designs in the paper that I'm not going to show you. All right, so first of all, this is just a check. As I said, I'm just going to simulate out the crisis with a tightening LTV constraint and a reduction in income. I'm plotting here. These are home prices. Uh, I'm going to suffer what everyone else. OK, no, I have a red line here. So that's home prices. Year zero is the crisis. And then this is in terms of years. So home prices fall and then go back up. If you look at this fall, that actually about 30% fall is about what happened in the crisis. This is the share of, of households with negative equity. You can look at what happened in the world. That's actually quite close. This is, these are default rates. Um, these are also quite close to what happens in the world. And this is uh, consumption, aggregate consumption of the households, which also is close to what happens in this world. I want you to think of this as a baseline. What I'm most interested in doing is I'm going to throw you, I'm going to add a different mortgage design, and I'll show you how these numbers look relative to this baseline. And then we'll compare gaps of how, how beneficial different mortgage designs might be. All right, so here is um, the magic wand. So imagine that you were in 2007, so year zero of this crisis. And you could take everybody out of their fixed rate mortgage and put everyone into an adjustable rate mortgage. All right, what's the difference? Well, the fixed rate mortgage, uh, long rates on the fixed rate mortgage are down about 70 basis points. So long-term rates, because short-term rates fall, in this model, long-term rates will also fall just via expectations hypothesis by about 70 basis points. So in the fixed rate mortgage world, long-term fixed rate mortgages are lower. However, households are going to be subject to a refinancing constraints, so they aren't going to necessarily going to be able to take advantage of that 70 basis points. So that'll, that shows up in that baseline dynamic that I showed you. All right? So what I'm, what I'm doing when I put people in adjustable rate mortgages is short rates fall by about 3%, so a big decline in short rates. And it's effectively an automatic refinancing. Everybody can take benefit of that, because if my mortgage was indexed to Short rates, and short rates fell 3%. Everybody who has an adjustable rate mortgage will benefit from that, rather than in the fixed rate mortgage world, only guys who could refinance would benefit from that. OK, so that's the, that's the experiment I'm doing here. And you can see here, it has a beneficial impact. No surprise. Uh, house prices, the blue line here is the baseline. The purple line here is under this adjustable rate mortgage. And again, this is with short rates falling 300 basis points in the crisis. Uh, there's less default. Uh, prices fall less. Uh, and consumption falls less, okay? Kind of about what you'd expect. I'll, I'll, I'll translate these numbers in terms of consumption equivalent welfare uh, in a few slides. Uh, what is happening here, it's, it's, it's mostly about uh, young households, and you can see this by looking at default rates. So the blue line here is the fixed rate mortgage. The red line here is this adjustable rate mortgage where I, which I gave people in the crisis. The difference here is the default rates. The yellow line is the difference in default rates. And you can see here, this is in terms of age of the model. So 10 years is you've been earning income for 10 years. Uh, and those are the guys, these guys who have been earning income for 10 years and guys who have been earning income for about 20 years, these are guys who are at different stages of the life cycle who bought homes. These are the guys who really default less. Okay, that's, the, that's one big impact of, uh, of the adjustable rate mortgage. And then the other impact is uh, rental. So young guys who previously were renting are going to be more inclined to buy because the payment that they face with an adjustable rate mortgage is much lower than the payment they would face with a fixed rate mortgage. With a fixed rate mortgage, fixed rate rate, fixed rate mortgage rates are down 70 basis points. The adjustable rate mortgage rate is down by 300 basis points. Okay, so that's, that's really what's happening. Um, the second exercise I'm going to do is I'm going to allow people to optimize ex ante. 
So what I just did before was I just gave people adjustable rate mortgages in the crisis. Now I'm just going to allow people ex ante to choose between adjustable and fixed and, and play out the world as it does. And uh, the adjustable rate mortgage is still beneficial. Uh, it's not quite as beneficial. It's about a third less beneficial. And the reason it's about a third less beneficial is because what happens is with adjustable rate mortgages, people anticipate that there's going to be insurance in the crisis. So they, they know that their payments are going to fall in the crisis, the adjustable rate mortgage, so they, they lever up ex ante. This is the leverage distribution by LTV uh, with the adjustable rate mortgage in orange and the fixed rate mortgage in blue. And you can see this adjustable rate mortgage makes people kind of push out uh, further out. They, they lever up more because they know that their payments are going to fall, and that undoes some of the benefits. Again, this is kind of what you'd expect. Uh, this does suggest, by the way, that uh, contract design could be uh, well paired with something like an LTV constraint. So sort of mixing macro prudential tools with mortgage design and LTV constraint could deliver all of the benefits that I showed you before uh, by, say, uh, replicating the blue line here. All right. Um, as I said, the, the big benefit here is really coming from young homeowners. And you can see this up in this top panel here. The top panel, what I'm graphing is uh, I'm graphing by age the welfare benefit of the switch from the fixed rate mortgage to the adjustable rate mortgage. Okay? Uh, the welfare benefit here is computed as, suppose you're in 2007, you're going into the crisis, and I was to ask you, how much would you pay in an annual consumption benefit to go into the adjustable rate mortgage uh, for the rest of your life? That's the number I'm computing. And across all of our households here, the answer is 1.27% of annual consumption. Okay, so. I'm going into a crisis, and I ask, tell people, you know, you were in a fixed rate mortgage. I could throw you into an adjustable rate mortgage. How much would you benefit from that in consumption equivalent terms? And the answer is, I'll benefit with that at 1.27% of annual consumption per year for the rest of my life. Okay. Now I shouldn't store it. This is conditional on the crisis. So a crisis is hitting. So it's just max. I'm giving you a maximum benefit with a crisis hitting for sure. All right. We also in the paper do a steady state analysis, but this is the probably the most interesting number for this. Uh, uh, talk. Okay, so I'm also graphing for you those same percentages by type of agent, and in particular by age and by whether an agent is a homeowner or a renter. And you can see here the real big benefit here, which is this, uh, this orange line down here. I don't know if you can even see these numbers. This is minus 3, minus 4%. That there's, there's, a, there's about a 3, 4% welfare benefit off of a young homeowner by switching from the fixed to the adjustable. As you go later on in an in a, in a agent's life cycle, the benefits are considerably less. So it's really about young guys. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you why that is uh, over the next two slides. OK. Um, let me skip this one. All right. So the, the, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an, another mortgage design, which is a mortgage design that is a fixed rate mortgage, but allows you to do underwater refinancing. All right, why am I doing this? Because the comparison I just did between a fixed rate mortgage that we have in the world and adjustable rate mortgage has the adjustable rate mortgage beating the fixed rate mortgage in really in two ways. One is it is an automatic refinancing mortgage. Right? It automatically takes advantage of low interest rates as they come in the recession. The second thing that it does is it front loads uh, payment benefits because short rates fall more than long rates. So I'm showing you now a mortgage design that allows you automatic refinancing, but automatic refinancing to a long-term mortgage rate. Right? So imagine we could replay the US experiment where many people went into negative equity territory, but allowed them to fully benefit from the drop in long-term mortgage rates. All right, so that's the, the exercise that I'm going to do. And so here is result one. It basically doesn't help. Right? Uh, and when we first did this computation, it was surprising to us. So long-term mortgage rates are falling by 70 basis points. Agents are refinancing to take advantage of it. New homeowners are benefiting from the lower mortgage rate, but yet it really doesn't help anything. So I, this is the baseline. You can barely see the gap between the baseline and this new mortgage where people can refinance from an, in an underwater mortgage. Uh, but it doesn't matter very much. Uh, and in welfare equivalent terms, there's a 0.13% consumption equivalent welfare gain compared to the 1.3 I was showing you before. And the reason for this is because the long-term mortgage is, is priced off of the long end of the yield curve. The long end of the yield curve falls by 70 basis points. The short end of the yield curve falls by 300 basis points. 
The agents who are really benefiting in this economy from our, our calibration are young liquidity constrained agents. So fixing the present value of transfers of state contingency that you give agents, it's always better to give it to them front loaded rather than over the life of a mortgage. That's exactly what an adjustable rate mortgage does. It, it reduces payments in the recession, which benefits uh, someone who's liquidity constrained tremendously, whereas refinancing to a lower fixed rate is beneficial, but it spreads those benefits over the entire life of the mortgage. That's not going to be as beneficial. I mean, you, you can kind of see that, but what is most surprising is it almost has no benefit. Almost all of the benefit is coming off of the welfare benefit of targeting consumption relief, or really what I think of this is budget constraint relief to households who are young and uh, relatively uh, new homeowners, right? So that is um, a result that we, that we were surprised by, but really comes out very clearly once you start looking at this. The second thing that we did was we said, well, you know, long end of the yield curve can benefit from QE. So um, long-term rates in the US came down in part because the Fed bought a whole bunch of mortgages. Uh, that is something that you would expect to, to benefit the long end, the long-term mortgage design rather than an, a mortgage design that is keyed off of an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, and so we just went out and said, well, suppose you were able to lower long rates an additional 100 basis points below the expectations hypothesis long-term rate. How good is that? And the answer is it's good, but it's only still a welfare benefit of about 33 basis points, sorry, 0.33% compared to the 1.3% off of just the simple indexation to adjustable rate mortgages. So this is a way of saying that you know, QE is, is, is useful, but the, the real benefit is, is cutting current payments. Um, we do other stuff in the paper. I'm just gonna show you one last exercise because I think I am running uh, out of time or over time. And the last exercise I'm gonna do is I've kind of ba basically made a case for adjustable rate mortgages. That's really what I've, I've made a case for. Now, as many people uh, uh, are probably aware, uh, adjustable rate mortgages, th the way they're working in this model is because interest rates are correlated with income, right? And in the downturn, income falls and interest rates fall. You can imagine periods as we went through in the late 70s and the 80s when that correlation flips, right? And you get high interest rates as income is falling. In that case, an adjustable mortgage is going to do quite badly. So we, we study one other mortgage design. This is a mortgage design that I, Jan Eberly and I uh, wrote up in a Brookings paper a few years back, which is a fixed rate mortgage with the option to convert to an adjustable rate mortgage. So it's a standard fixed rate mortgage where you have an, an one-time option to convert yourself into an adjustable rate mortgage. It's, it looks a little exotic, but what it allows you to do is it puts a cap on the, the interest rate because if interest rates go up, as they did in the 80s in the Volcker episode, you wouldn't convert. You would just keep your low fixed rate mortgage. So it has the flavor of if you like your mortgage, you can keep it. But if interest rates fall, you can take benefit of this. Okay, so uh, I'll show you what that does. All right, so here's the benefit of that in the exercise I've just done, the exercise being the rerun the crisis. And the benefit of, the, of this, this EK mortgage is 0.92% uh, in, in, in consumption equivalent welfare gain compared to 1.3%. So it's not quite as good. Why is it not quite as good? Basically because banks are charging you for it. You're buying an option and banks charge you for it, so you're not quite as happy. Um, but we're running that in an ex experiment where we're just rerunning the US crisis where income is falling and interest rates are falling. We also do another exercise where we re-simulate the 1980s recession, the Volcker recession, where you would think that this would really benefit you, and the answer is it does. The adjustable rate mortgage loses 1.34% in terms of welfare, whereas this capped mortgage only loses a half percent. So that gives you a sense as to why this might be beneficial. There's more in the paper. We play around with monetary policy and kind of, there's a feedback here clearly between monetary policy and the benefit of a different mortgage design. We do this a couple different ways. I'm not gonna show you all of that because I'm out of time. Uh, I think the main thing I wanted to say is here, that's just the first order point. I really think mortgage design is a huge first order effect of importance to uh, welfare. So it's worth studying. Uh, we have studied designs which are indexed to interest rates. They seemed like the easiest ones to think about both from the standpoint of uh, understanding within a model as well as in terms of implementing. That is, they're within the space of current contracts, so they seem like relevant ones to look at. Uh, and if you want to know what I've learned so far from this, it's that mortgage designs that front load payment relief are really what look like they deliver uh, welfare benefits. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Alan.
Lauren? Okay, well, as a previous discussant, I should start by saying that I probably not the most natural choice of a discussant for this paper because much of what I know is on the corporate side, not the mortgages. I also don't spend my time uh, doing equilibrium models. But uh, nevertheless, the paper was very interesting because, of course, it has uh, a very important question at heart. And uh, Arvind didn't even need to use uh, equations, nor will I. So, um, the starting point here is that build-up of leverage in the economy is what makes uh, propagation of the crisis into the real economy. What we, we, this is the key piece that facilitates the propagation of the crisis from the shock into the real economy. And so, uh, specifically focus here will be on the household debt and accumulation of, house, uh, of debt in that sector. Now, once we acknowledge that point, the, uh, of course it would be nice to have policy tools that allow us to act effectively on this outstanding debt uh, during the crisis. Now there are two ways to do that. There is ex post and ex ante ways of, uh, of dealing with a debt overhang. Now from what we've learned in the years following the crisis through different programs that we are trying to facilitate uh, refinancings of the, uh, of the uh, mortgages and generally uh, easing the burden of the uh, debt in the household sector is that the programs were not very effective. And it seems that there are important implementation frictions. So what uh, Arvind and his quarters do here, they say, all right, well, uh, let's, take a step back and if we, if we design contracts ex ante that already have features that connect contracts to the monetary policy, then that could be a, a solution that helps us out. Now with that question in mind of thinking about uh, what is uh, a type of contract that would help us uh, to maximize welfare before the crisis, as well as help effectively to deal with, uh, uh, with the problem that we, uh, once we run into the crisis. So this is the question about an intensive margin here. We are thinking about debt that is already uh, outstanding. So that question, uh, once we articulate the question, the answer actually, as Arin pointed out, is rather trivial, and we don't need, um, the intuition for it is, is very, is very simple. Of course, if you're going to introduce this element of contingency into these contracts and allow, especially if you give this option of conversion during the crisis into the variable rate, then adjustment conditional on the monetary policy being uh, the one that lowers interest rates, then that would translate into lower payments for the household, and that's a very uh, effective way of dealing with that. So that's good news, uh, but that's not the where I see the main insight. The way to think about this paper, what it provides, the main contribution of this paper is that it provides a quantitative model that ties together consumption, defaults, and housing prices, as well as has this element of realistic features of a, of a mortgage that, uh, so and this model allows us to throw different mortgage designs and come out with quantitative measures for thinking about which contractual features are the best one. So there are two ways, for, given that this is a main contribution, that this is, this is a quantitative tool that is provided to us for thinking about mortgage design and effectiveness of monetary policy through this mortgage design. So there are, to me, there are two ways to think about this paper. Um, first of all, I think that the paper is really nice and it certainly satisfies the wish list of the welcoming speech of what the model should deliver. But given the job of the discussion, one way to, to think about it is currently the model delivers a large economic effect that favors adjustable rate mortgages. And so one thing is to think about what are the assumptions that are hardwired into this model and what are the things that are missing that make this result large? And do we believe in them? Probably we will, but uh, nevertheless I'll highlight a couple. And the second point is, okay, well, Worst case scenario doesn't work. Worst case scenario, the effect is economically small. What is the damage that we are doing by introducing this policy and by shifting the household towards the uh, adjustable rate mortgages? All right. Uh, 
one thing that Arim didn't emphasize that much, but much of the discussion of the damage, potential damage, is the fact, of course, that by hardwiring, the relationship between the monetary policy and uh, mortgages and counting on the fact that interest rates will go down, there is a settlement, well, what if the interest rates actually go up? And uh, one thing that you might consider to add more color to the discussions that you already have is that not every recession, of course, has the same implications for how you would be cutting rates. Right now, there is just a view of whether they either go up or they go down, and I think that there is elements that you can reflect on that. But there are other points, and some of them are there in the paper, but in, for example, the first one uh, is a, if, if people are shifted into, into aggressively into the adjustable rate mortgage, then there is the initial problem is which you started, where we were trying to solve macro fragility actually can be aggravated because everybody in expectation of that there will be benefit of low interest rate and downturns will increase the leverage. Now it's present as one of the analysis where they blend the adjustable rate mortgage and fixed rate mortgage, but uh, if you take it to the extreme of policy actions, as this could be, become a very important point. Now, the other thing that is not sought through in the ways in the model is okay. Well, who carries the risk? And currently, the banking sector is this present value uh, solving agent, ne risk neutral agent, and it assumes no frictions and nothing else in the portfolio on the, in this, on the size of the bank. And the question is, well, if perhaps Part of the answer as to why these products are not predominant in the current environment could be tied to the fact that something else will, could be moving on the side of the bank balance sheet. And it seems like thinking in that direction might be something relevant. Now, one thing, other thing that is missing and perhaps it's worth reflecting about is that introduction of the adjustable rate mortgages or anything that layers up options in the time before or after or uh, it makes the product less tractable. I mean, fixed rate mortgage is easily understood by most of the household. Once we make the contract fancier, it, it seems to me that we will definitely need a little bit of a tighter oversight of, uh, over this product, which is not impossible, but definitely not free. Now, on the size effects, so this is as to what is the, what is the downside? What if the upside is not that large? What damage are we making? In terms of the size of the effect, so currently we're saying, okay, well, arms are winning, and let's reflect on a couple of assumptions that are there uh, that delivers that result. So first point is, what about unconventional monetary policy? So the entire paper is, the premise of this paper is based on this graph. It's a tight relationship between the short-term rates and the reference rate, which is a prime and LIBOR rate. And so you, you can see from this picture that most of the time they're very, very tightly related. In fact, they're always very tightly related. And this picture already points out to the effectiveness of ARM in the period, because since 2009, these reference rates are flat, right? So to me, the way they approach this quantitative easing tools is a little bit of cheating because the three, scenar three scenarios that evaluate, they start with the fact that, well, there is a lower short-term rate by 100 bips plus something on the long-term action. And once you remove that short-term rate, 100 bips, then really there is, th there is nothing that's working that much toward, towards the arms. So it seems like the arms in this context might be a little bit overstated from that perspective. Uh, and to add one point on the corporate side. So the corporate side, there is uh, senior secure credit is variable rate, which is what actually ARM in the context of the paper means here. And, uh, and so there is a paper that follows what happens to the outstanding balance of debt through the fact that senior secured debt is uh, a, a, variable, uh, a variable rate for corporate sector. And the conclusion here is that, in fact, this paper uses the quantitative easing period and the fact that the short-term rate doesn't move any longer as at the point to contrast that it loses its effectiveness. Now, the second point on the measurement is uh, the paper does a fantastic job uh, calibrating it to, uh, to the default profile, but I felt that there was a missing piece there calibrating it to the consumption. And what we're looking here is a paper, a graph from the paper by uh, Marco Di Maggio and, and co-authors, which tells us, well, 
the effect of reduction in payment on the consumption is unambiguous. But another thing that comes out of this paper is that the pass-through of the reduction of payment to consumption is actually not one-to-one. -one. It's more, it, it wasn't crystal clear what it is, but it felt to me like it's a, between a third and 50%. And so, of course, if you incorporate that parameter into the model, then the magnitude of this arm welfare effect will go instantly in the obvious way down. Now, the third observation on the size effect is has more to do with how committed you are to this blank page approach that you're taking here to the design. So, I, and if you are, so the papers, the way the paper looks is ignore anything that exists, we get to redesign the world from scratch. And in that world, we're gonna come in and come out uh, and design a perfect contract. Now, to the degree that you're gonna work somewhat with, if that's, you're comfortable with that approach, you can ignore this comment, but to the degree that we have to work with contracts that are already somewhat out there, and if you Google ARM, it actually doesn't tell you it's a variable rate, it says, well, it's a contract that has a fixed period, uh, as that has this initial period of uh, a fixed rate, and then after that, it's a variable rate. So say that we introduce that element of that there is a period, and by the way, it's five, seven, 10 years, then what you're gonna have is you're gonna have, oh, that starts to slow, that slow you down. Now, Arvin mentioned that there are 45 generations of people in the pipeline taking mortgages all the time, so it slows you down, but not quite that much, right? Because not everybody, if you have a, slow down period and not everybody instantly with a magic one converted into variable rate, but it's more traditional R forms and some people will enter with a delay, but uh, nevertheless with many, many generations stacked together that will work slow, uh, that, that it will be smaller effect, but not that dramatically. Now, if you allow for a feature that was crystal clear present in the corporate sector, which is the fact that when you go into the boom, there is plenty of refinancing and so, once you're refinancing, then you, what actually would happen is that this pipeline approach with many generations just going one after another actually starts to bulk. This is what it looked like in the corporate sector. So this is a picture that reflects that it's not a pipeline. There is, you, as you go into the crisis, there is a refinancing, constant refinancing. And so the second the crisis shuts down, what you observe is that most of the expirations actually sits in year five, because corporate loans are five year maturity, which would mean that if you translate this to the arm world with five year fixed period, you land in a situation where you have five years uh, you, and you cannot act on them. But again, as I said, this is only to the point if you gonna, if you gonna, if you wanna somehow go for perhaps more practical approach and start working with products that already exist out there as opposed to taking a blank page approach. My final comment, um, so there is this element which also speaks to the magnitude of the effect. The, one of the fundamental underlying assumptions is this price default spiral. And this price default spiral is premised to a large degree on the fact that there is the rental market and the ownership market are segmented. And so uh, the rental market price is fixed and it's really when you sell, uh, when you, the house, the household defaults, there is a massive effect on the, on the price of the, of the house. Now, there is some academic evidence on this, but it's rather not direct, and uh, it's a bit harder to reconcile with anecdotal evidence. Unambiguous that there is a cost of liquidating a household, but the question is, does it have this large impact on the, on the, on the price? And granted that there are frictions from conversion into, from a rental property into condominium, but actually the frictions going in the opposite direction. You can buy a place and you can rent it and there are no frictions on that. So that seems like the frictions that go in the direction of uh, that you would need to offset the effect that is modeled here, actually rather smaller at least, of course, anecdotally. Very nice paper, thank you. Go ahead. So I would propose that we collect some comments and questions and that you maybe answer in one go unless there are a lot of questions. Yes, please. <laughs> 